Your theme for this conference is developing deep roots. I cannot think of a more appropriate, more necessary principle than for us to talk about the importance of laying down deep roots in this next generation. Our roots determine everything about who we are, who we become, how we live, and what we care about. That is why it is so imperative that we, as leaders, teach our young people about the power of roots, of origins, and of foundations in their lives. Let me say this at the outset. This will not be your traditional conference address. I want to offer you some straight talk today as educators and leaders of the next generation. And more importantly, give you some takeaways. I want you to leave with something that you can apply in your schools, in your districts, and in your classrooms. Let me start with a premise. Our nation is in a time of deep division. We are at each other's throats. We no longer respect disagreement. We are like an angry mob yelling at one another. Just look at social media. We are an angry, unkind, mean lot. We, the adults in the room, that's us, are teaching our kids how not to resolve conflict, how not to respect our differences, how not to participate in the greatness of American values. We are teaching them how to disengage, to retreat, and to use technology as a weapon. Folks, if we're honest, something has grown cold in our kids and in our culture. We no longer seem to value those things and those life codes or core root values, God, family, country, that many of us in this room grew up with. We are a surface people now. We don't like deep. We don't have time because our devices have taken over our lives. We are too busy. We have no time for our kids, our marriages, our relationships, and our faith. We are busy. And when you are busy, you miss things. Putting down roots requires time. It requires nurturing. It requires sunlight. It requires love, patience, compassion, conversation and investment. Our kids are like newly planted trees, trees that need time, nourishment, love, compassion, and encouragement to grow to great heights. In a world that now values only what is good for me versus what's good for my neighbor, is it any wonder that our kids have adapted to a life of texting, ghosting, blocking, deleting and canceling one another? Do we really wonder why the teen and youth bullying and suicide rates are at an all-time high in America? Our kids need hope. Our kids need us. They need the power of our example in what we model to them. The responsibility, leaders, is ours, not theirs. This is on us, not them. We must set the example we want them to follow. All of us as educators, parents, leaders, aunts and uncles, communities, and as political leaders most of all. So the question before us this morning is this. How do we model greatness, respect a code of unity and civility with our next generation, and teach them about the power of diversity as our greatest strength in America? It starts with those roots. Because everything in our lives and in our institutions has to do with the beginning, the roots. I think we can all agree that our nation is at a crossroads right now. We are at a critical place of decision. Who are we and who do we want to be as Americans? The past four years, regardless of your politics, that doesn't matter. The past four years have been challenging for our nation. We have experienced unprecedented political division, anger, protests, marches, gender wars, racial division, 
and open supremacy in my home state of Virginia in Charlottesville in 2017. Immigrant children separated from their families. The rise of so-called nationalism, which frankly confuses patriotism with tribalism. That is not the best of who we are as Americans. The conclusion that I have come to in the wake of all of this as we look at the future of America is that the only way we as a people and as a nation will make it out of this current dark place united as one America is that we the people must make a choice to return to one of our most fundamental roots, our founding motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. We as leaders and educators must help our kids to choose their better angels over their darker impulses, love over hate. We have to choose the many of us over those who seek to divide us. As President Lincoln said, quoting Jesus in Matthew 12, a house divided against itself cannot stand. We are operating in a different America. Demographic shifts are causing discomfort and fear. America will be a majority minority nation in just a decade or more. Tribalism is rising. Nationalism is rising. We must then find a way to exist with one another, to help one another, to lift as we ourselves climb beyond our gender, our race, our religion, and our creed. But it starts again with roots. We must stop buying into, if you hear nothing else I say today, don't miss this. We must stop buying into what separates us and instead focus on what unites us. America is what unites us. America, folks, is the story of us, of all of us. It is the story of dreamers, of risk takers and explorers, of indigenous people and farmers, of patriots and immigrants, and yes, of African slaves. We all built America together. America is a story. It is an ideal, it is a decision made by 55 men who signed off on the Declaration of Independence that changed the course of humankind. Some of us in this room are conservative, some of us are liberal, some of us sit in the middle. And I want you to know today that wherever you sit, it's okay. Your great governor of this state who will be with us shortly is a great example of someone who walks this out. Louisiana, according to the political pundits like myself, is a ruby red state. And your governor is a blue Democrat. Yet, he is successful as a leader here because he understands the power of inclusion and the power of respecting different points of view. He is a uniter. And we need more politicians that unite us and not divide us. If we are going to heal this next generation and know that they need to be healed, then we must commit ourselves to being engaged with one another in a new way. Our great republic will not stand if we continue to rip and tear at one another as we are doing right now. Social media, Nita was talking about social media. Social media has become an ugly, marring battlefield of words and anger. We cut. We unfriend, we block, we delete. We say and do things on social media that people would never say to your face. I'm old enough to remember when you had a beef with somebody, you either had to pass them a note in study hall or you had to get a couple of your friends and go have a conversation with them. Listen, one of the things that is tearing us apart as a nation, it's, it's filtered into our workplaces, into our homes, our communities, is the issue of disagreement. Let me be clear about this. We have the right as Americans to disagree. But when disagreement becomes darkness, disrespect, and disdain for one another, we're on the wrong path. 
Leaders in this room, we need a course correction, and I believe that there is no group better suited for that course correction than you. We need you. Our kids need you to be the spark that gets the fire started. Let me be clear. I don't care what party you are in or about your politics, whether you are liberal or conservative, black or white. We are Americans first. What we must care about is preparing our young people to be equipped, engaged, and informed citizens who can be the light in a dying, dark, and often disrespectful world. And I want to charge all of us today, me included, to go out into the world and to live a life that reflects the values of unity, inclusion, respect, optimism, and hard work that truly makes America great. We are always at our best, my fellow Americans, when we are together as one. So you're saying, Sophia, that all sounds nice. That's good. So how do we honor our own liberty and respect the liberty of others and work together as one? How do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Pretty simple. We choose. We decide. We demand accountability from our leaders and from ourselves. We speak up when we see a fellow American or human being being demeaned. Get involved, don't sit by, say something. We choose. We make sure as leaders that the rooms that we enter into, the boards that we sit in, the, the, the C-suites that we're in, that the table reflects diversity. That it's not just all people who look like me at the table or look like you that it is a table where we can hear different views, process through different lenses. That's the best of America. In that spirit, I challenge you today to teach our next generation about what lasts in this life. What lasts? It's not money. It's not fame or fortune. Those things don't last. What lasts is character, code, and compassion. What last are strong roots. The power of a teacher, of an educator, and a good education in your life can be life-changing. It can lay down roots that shape you forever. I will never forget my high school Latin teacher, Joan E. Daniels. She changed my life. I was a child of an alcoholic parent, working class family, family of, you talk about uh, what's the word talk about when you have family dysfunction? It's a generational curse. We got it in my family. Yet she saw something in me. She pushed me. She poured into me when others said that a black little girl from a working class neighborhood could never go to college or law school. She said, Sophia, yes, you can. And I did. Miss Daniels died in 1997 of cancer. She was only in her 60s. But I kept in touch with her every day of my life, every year, every season, post high school. And when she died, we set up a scholarship in her name. So don't tell me that you, teachers, educators, superintendents, leaders in our education don't make a difference because you do. And you do every day. If but for that teacher, I would not be standing here in front of you today. So as I close, I put together a list of what I call seven root principles, okay? Now you're going to want to write these down, tweet these, share these. You can tag me at I am Sophia Nelson on all platforms. But I really thought about what is it that we want to impart to this next generation? And most of all, what do we want to walk out as I challenge you and myself to be a model and an example? Because the truth, folks, is they're watching. They're watching what we do. Nobody cares what you say if what you do doesn't match up. These kids are smarter than we ever were. They've got devices. They can find out things in a nanosecond that we're, we would be. You remember the Dewey Decimal System? You remember having to do that? They don't know what that is. They're smart, and they're paying attention. So seven root principles I want to share with you for you and for you to impart. Number one, you ready? Number one, know your value. Know your value. Let me tell you something. If you don't know your value and worth, 
No one else ever will. Because it all starts with you. Thomas Jefferson, one of our founding fathers, a great Virginian, you knew I had to sneak a Virginian in here, right? He penned the eternal words that are still with us to this day from the Declaration of Independence. And he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What Mr. Jefferson was saying is, know your worth, know who you are, know whose you are, and that you've got something as a human being of value that no man or woman can ever take from you. You've got unalienable rights given by your creator, your value. Know your value. You must teach your students that they have value no matter where they come from, no matter their socioeconomic demographic, Everybody has value. Number two, be accountable. Now, this one is never popular because nobody likes to be accountable. But I have what I call the three C's. And this is something I try to practice, and it's very important for our young people to practice. The three C's. Number one is consistency. Simply do what you say you're going to do. I told you they're watching. And if you got teenagers at home, I don't like teenagers. But if you have teenagers at home, you understand that everything is a, well, you did that, or you said that, so be consistent. Do what you say you're going to do. Number two, character. Now, I tell people this all the time. You know, reputation is situational. Depending on who you talk to, you might hear several different things about me. But character is who you are. So develop your character and focus on your character because your reputation is situational. But your character is who you are. And the third thing that every one of us in this room needs to really work on is the other C, capacity. Because none of us has any. We're done. We're overwhelmed. Our cup runneth over. We're drained. We're tired. We're weary. Particularly in the women in the room, can I get an amen on that one? We are tired. Learn that no is a complete sentence. Learn that you need to pass on some things. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to be on every club and on every board and on the church committee and the sorority committee and I'm talking about myself. You don't have to do all that. You need to free up some capacity so that you can sit with you and sit with the next generation and engage. Number three, teach people how to treat you. Now listen, this is a code I did not like. Because it's always easier to point the finger at somebody else and say, they were mean to me, or that was unfair, they didn't treat me right. You know what I learned? I teach people how to treat me by how I treat me, by the boundaries that I set or do not set, by the way I value myself or not. This generation needs to learn how to re-engage in human discourse and how to be of value and how to teach people how to treat them. This is a very important life code because it applies to every area of your life, leaders. If you don't like the way something is in your life or the way someone is treating you, you're the problem. And that's a hard pill to swallow because you always have the power of choice to do something different. You always have the power to say, I don't want to do that. No is a complete sentence. Teach people how to treat you. Number four, lift as you climb. Now, ladies, I'm going to pick on us for a moment. I think the fellas do this better than us. Lift as you climb. There's an old boys network for a reason. They've been at it a little bit longer. But this one's important because it gets back to the culture that we're in right now. It's a very selfish, very self-focused, very instantaneous culture that we live in. And helping others isn't always the first instinct that we have now. But let me tell you what I know for sure. What goes up comes down. So how you treat people on your way up is how you're going to be treated on your way down. So queen bee syndrome or king syndrome, it's a failure at the end of the day. It doesn't work. Lifting 
others as you yourself climb ensures not only that you will be successful, but that others will be successful. And I've seen it in my own career. The person who was the mentor at the job, the person who helped, they get a pink slip 20 years down the road. And you know what? The people that they helped, that they were good to, they make sure that that person gets taken care of, that they land, that they get another position, that they get a really good compensation on the way out. But the person who was nasty to people, the person who didn't help people, the person who was, y'all clapping because you know people like this, the person who was ruling with an iron fist, people celebrate when they go out the door. You don't want to be that person. So lift others as you yourself climb. Just a few more and we're done. Number five, this one's important. Have courageous conversations. Courageous conversations. My, 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 do we need to do that now more than ever. One of the reasons our country is in the strife and the turmoil it's in is because rooms that look like this, and this is an amazingly diverse room, we still haven't learned how to talk to each other. We still haven't learned to be able to, to hear that man's point of view, which may be different from mine, and let that man have his point of view and respect his point of view as you want yours respected. What is this attacking and demeaning and, and calling people names because they don't agree with the way you may see the world? Courageous conversations is this. Texting ain't talking. Let me say it again, I think you missed that. Texting ain't talking. We have gotten into this cowardly way of communicating now, particularly when we have to say something bad, we're gonna text it or send a group email, reply to all. That's not the way to do this. A conversation, let me take you back to some old school. A conversation is audible. You hear me, I hear you, we're speaking to each other and we're listening. It is not texting, it is not tweeting, it is not sub-posting on Facebook when you're mad at somebody and you go do a post and you tag 50 other people because you want to out so-and-so. That is not conversation. And it is infecting us, and everybody in here knows exactly what I'm talking about because you've seen it in the workplace, you've seen it in the schools, you've seen it. Guys, we got to learn to talk. As my nanny used to say, talk before you walk. So before you quit on something, you better have a conversation. Have the courage of your convictions, but also be willing to listen. Listen. Don't listen to respond. Listen. Number six. Now these last two, number six and seven, come directly from my grandmother. She had a sixth grade education, South Carolina girl, smartest woman I ever knew. And I miss her every day. She's been gone 20 years this year. And she taught me two things that have stuck with me, and I use them everywhere I go. Number six, she said, baby, never cut what you can untie. I'm going to let that sit in with you for a moment. Never cut what you can untie. How fast are we now to cut somebody, to be done? I'm out. I was on the airplane with a man coming in, and he looked like Duck Dynasty. I swear to God, I thought he was Duck Dynasty. <laughs> and this man wore me out about his ex-wife the whole flight, and what she did to him, and how he divorced her, and which. And I was like, wow. I was like, do you want to pray? We pray. <laughs> but, you know, he really felt like he had a badge because he showed her he divorced her. And then we began to talk about the impact on his kids and on his grandkids, and now the family split apart and some people aren't talking. And I said, probably not the result you wanted. Would have been better to try to work it out. Maybe y'all needed to untie for a minute. What am I saying? What my grandmother was saying is don't burn bridges. Just don't burn bridges unnecessarily. There are times in your life, folks, and seasons in your lives where you need to just step back from a relationship maybe a career, maybe you can't step back, unfortunately, from your spouse for a while. I guess that's not going to work. But the thing is, it's better to untie than to cut. Be clear, there are times when you need to cut things. And there are times when you need to not just burn bridges, you need to blow those bridges up. 
But those are rare. Those, those should not be our everyday temperament. And if we're being honest in this room, that's our everyday temperament. You see it. People are short-tempered. They, they, they're just done. I don't want to deal with it. I'm out. That's what we're teaching this next generation. You do know Gen Xers in the room. Baby boomers, you guys are retiring and you're chilling. Gen Xers, we're, we're sane. We're okay. You're going to be all right. But this next generation, millennials, I don't know what they're going to do to us. So my thing is, is that you need to... We're teaching them some really bad stuff is what I'm saying, and that's the point of what I've gone through this morning and touching on some of the things, the roots we need to get back to, but never cut what you can untie, folks. Remember that, because when you untie, you can go back. You can have a different perspective. You can work it out. But the last thing that my grandmother taught me, and I will end with this, and she loved to say baby, you southern grandmothers, baby. She said, baby, you better know your front row. You better know your front row. What's that mean? What's that mean, Grandma? Well, what she was saying is, is who you surround yourself with is everything in this life. Who are your friends? Show me your friends, I'll show you your life. You know, Leadership 101 principle is the five people you spend the most time with in your life determine your life. That's real, folks. We all know, particularly as educators, if young people get on the wrong track with the wrong crowd, it can change their destiny. If you get with the right crowd on the right track, it can change a destiny. And I like to illustrate this point of knowing your row with a story. It's out of scripture. It's a story that you know. It's in Mark chapter 2. Now, I'm in Louisiana, so I can talk about the Bible, and I like that. So you can find it in Mark Chapter 2, verse 2. It's a story about some friends. Now, these friends have known each other for their whole lives. And one of the friends is paralyzed, and he lays on a mat. And he's been that way his entire life, the Bible says. Well, one day his friends heard that a guy named Jesus was in town. And what they decided to do was they got together and they said, look, we're going to go get our friend, and we're going to go take him to this guy named Jesus because maybe Jesus can... Heal him. Maybe you can fix him. So they go to their friend. They pick up his mat, and they carry him. Now, the Bible records that they carried him to Peter's house. Now, we all love Peter. Peter's always got a party at his house. So they go to Peter's house. The problem is, folks, is that everybody else has heard Jesus is in town, too. So they can't get in. Now, let me tell you what 99.9% .9 of your friends and my friends would have done. They would have... Laid you down and said, look, I tried to take you in. I tried to get you in the door, but I can't. But let me tell you what these friends did. The Bible records that these friends walked up a hill. They cut a hole through the roof, and they lowered him down. Now, what am I saying? You better get you some Mark chapter 2 friends. You better get you some friends that are going to walk up a hill, cut a hole through a roof for you, and lower you down to get your healing. Who you hang around with, who you are connected to, determines everything about who you become. We, in this room, are charged with a great responsibility. Taking care of and educating and producing the next generation of presidents, senators, governors, leaders, businessmen, nurses, doctors, engineers. That's this room. Do you know how much power that is to shape the future? I just gave you seven things. Just seven. And I by no means have the answer to everything, anything. But what I know is, is that my grandmother's wisdom works because I put it into practice every day. A lady with a sixth grade education taught this Juris Doctorate degree more than she ever learned in school. I want to thank you for your hospitality this morning. God bless you, God keep you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.